Hello, this is an I Am Kitty Hollywood. Now, today's review is of a film that is 81 years old, but you would not know it. Columbia's 1934 release, It Happened One Night. This film is produced and directed by Frank Capra. The screenplay is by Frank Capra's longtime associate, Robert Riskin. It's adapted by a from a magazine story, Night Bus, and that was written by Samuel Hopkins Adams. The music is by Howard Jackson, the cinematography is by Joseph Walker, and the costume design is by Robert Kellogg. The film stars Clark Gable, Claudette Colbert, Walter Connolly, and Roscoe Carnes. It's about a spoiled heiress and a, uh, an unemployed crack reporter who end up on the same bus to New York. Blankets, hitchhiking and carrots ensue. Now, look, in many ways, it's kind of amazing that this film actually exists at all. The only people who were interested in getting it made were Frank Capra and Robert Riskin. Harry Cohn ran Columbia Studios, and Columbia Studios was the poor cousin of the big studios. Um, Frank Capra sort of bluffed his way into Hollywood and ended up getting a job at Columbia Studios. He lasted there because he had an engineering background and he was able to cope with the coming of sound much better than a lot of other directors. He did eventually become Columbia's most important director, but still, Columbia didn't have a fancy pants reputation and most of its movie stars in its films were borrowed from other studios rather than being kept on the books. So they offered the role of Ellie Andrews to Myrna Loy, Carol Lombard, Constance Bennett, Margaret Sullivan and Miriam Hopkins, who all said no. Then they offered the role to Claudette Colbert. She said no. Warner Brothers wouldn't loan Betty Davis out. They went back to Claudette Colbert, said, okay, we'll pay you double your salary and it will only take four weeks to film. She said yes. For the male lead, Peter Warren, they offered the role to Robert Montgomery. He said, no. Then Louis B. Mayer, who was the head of MGM Studios, came to Harry Cohen and said, you can have Clark Gable. Now, big studios tended to loan out their famous movie stars to Columbia when they'd done something wrong. It was kind of their version of, you go to your room and you think about what you've done. Clark Gable wasn't thrilled, but he didn't have any choice. Filming began and everybody thought the thing was going to be a huge flop. There'd been a number of bus films made recently and it looked like this was just a try and catch in on the whole bus thing kind of a deal. Claudette Colbert apparently complained about everything every single day. When it came out, it wasn't an immediate surefire success. It was pulled from a lot of the major cinemas. The ones that it did stay in, it grew, it grew word of mouth spread and it became a solid hit. And then when it was nominated for the top five Oscars for best picture, best director, best actor, best actress and best adapted screenplay, everyone just about fell down. And then when it won, when it scooped the pool, well, to quote Wallace Shawn, it was inconceivable. That wasn't very good. Anyhow, inconceivable. Anyway, you know what I mean. Claudette Colbert did not attend the ceremony. She was on a train to go on holidays. They pulled her off the train, the Columbia execs, got her to the ceremony. She said, thank you, in her traveling clothes, went and got back on the train again. It was, it was extraordinary. Now, this film was made just before the production code came into being, like, you know, five months or so before it. And as a result, it's got a much freer feel than a lot of the films made just slightly afterwards. And it also gets away with a whole lot of dialogue that wouldn't have been that common afterwards. You know, there's nothing I like better than to meet a high-class mama that can snap back at you. Because the colder they are, the hotter they get. That's what I always say. <laughs> yes, sir. When a cold mama gets hot, boy, how she sizzles. <laughs> now, you're just my type. Believe me, sister, I could go for you in a big way. Fun on the side, shapely, they call me. With accent on the fun, believe you me. 
Leave you me. You bore me to distraction. <laughs> Incidentally, it happened one night had an enormous influence on the creation of Bugs Bunny. Fritz Freeling, who came up with Bugs Bunny, loved this film, watched it over and over and over. And Bugs Bunny sort of surefire patter was very much influenced by both Oscar Shapley and Clark Gable's method of speaking. Uh, the way that Clark Gable ate carrots informed how Bugs Bunny ate carrots. And there's also the mention of a Bugs in the film as well, which sort of led on to the whole thing. They'll stop, all right. It's all a matter of knowing how to handle them. Oh, and you're an expert, I suppose. Expert? Yeah, I'm going to write a book about it. Call it The Hitchhiker's Hail. There's no end to your accomplishments, is there? Look, this film has a real less is more approach and it works. It, it's sexy. The scene where Ellie and Peter are lying in separate beds in the same room with a blanket between them and the moonlight's shining down on them and they're, they're musing about life. It is, it's a sexy piece of work. It's one of the loveliest things there is on the screen to watch. Um, one of the things Claudette Colbert complained about a lot was, well, legs. She was supposed to show her legs in the film and she said, I'm not showing my legs. So they got a stunt double in and then she didn't like the stunt double's legs. And she said, though, that is not my leg. Pride one out. It's her own leg that you are seeing in this film. And then Clark Gable apparently brought the sales of men's undershirts plummeting down to the ground because he takes his shirt off in the film. He's not wearing an undershirt. Men threw theirs out. I'm not having any of this. Anyway, look out for Alan Hale in this film. Now, he's best known as Little John in The Adventures of Robin Hood. Made a number of films with Errol Flynn, but he's also very well known for being Alan Hale Jr.'s father. And Alan Hale Jr. is the skipper on Gilligan's Island. The scene where Peter and Ellie attempt to fool the detective on Ellie, detectives on Ellie's trail that they're not really them is dynamite. How many times have I told you to stop butting in when I'm having an argument? Well, you don't have to lose your temper. You don't have to lose your temper. That's what this, the film really feels much younger than it is, in a way. The, the mismatched road trip couple is such a common theme now, filmically. But these are the two who originated the whole thing. The spark and the chemistry of Clark Gable and Claudette Colbert, no matter what a kind of a time they were having making the film, is so, so real, so dynamic that it draws you in. The few glimpses of Depression-era life that Frank Capra gives you in this film also give you a glimpse of a whole group of people just trying to get by in the world. And really, that's what brings it closer to us now, because in essence, we're still all really just trying to get by. Now watch it for the walls of Jericho. Watch it for the bus sing along. It's great. Watch it because it makes sleeping on hay seem romantic and not itchy. It happened one night, 10 out of 10.